everyone. Thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman with a special edition of Chicago Tonight. This evening, we're bringing you some of our favorite stories and moments from the last few months. Here's what we're looking at. We meet the founder of a run club whose message is to run your way, even if it's slow AF. When you're cruising along one of Chicagoland's highways, what's on your mind? WTTW News explains how our highway system gets its exit numbers. One on one with Peter Sagel on 26 years of hosting Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. It was like a dream to become uh, the owners of this place. And we take you inside a historic little village theater. After the break, why you should feel comfortable running at any speed in a conversation recorded earlier. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Alexandra and John Nichols family, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Chances are you've already spotted several of these today, runners. The popular physical activity app Strava says running was its most uploaded sport of 2023. But with a growing number of recreational runners, questions about inclusivity have also risen. Our next guest says he didn't always feel welcomed in the sport. Now he's got a book to make sure everyone can get in on the run. It's called Slow AF Run Club, the ultimate guide for anyone who wants to run. And joining us now is author and eight-time marathoner, Martinez Evans, who also started the online community, the Slow AF Run Club. And I'm sure that AF stands for always fun <laughs> or slow and fun run club. Slow and fabulous. That's it. Martinez Evans, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. So uh, you often tell the story of how you got started with running. A doctor told you that you needed to lose weight or you would die. Mm -hmm. You responded with, I'm going to run a marathon. He laughed. Uh, why running? How did, had you considered running before that day? Absolutely not. So I was being facetious when I told this doctor I was going to run a marathon. Because he was like, you know, you need to start walking on a track and things of that sort. I'm like, you don't even know who I am. So I'm going to show you who I am. So I was like, I'm going to run a marathon. He laughed at me. And I was like, you know, I got to prove him wrong. So that's what I did. Did you pull marathon out of the air? Like versus, you know, you could have started swimming or rowing or biking, but it was marathon. Yeah, it just came out the air. <laughs> you know, when somebody's calling you fat, you're trying to think about anything to um, not put hands on them. So I thought to myself, you know, the best thing I can say is, you know what, I'm going to run a marathon. Um, you've run eight of them yeah. since you said those words. Um, it was during one of those races, though. Someone uh, yelled something unkind. Uh, but you were inspired by it, mm -hmm. by those words. Uh, what did they yell and then what went through your mind? So I was running New York City Marathon and uh, this guy told me, hey buddy, you're slow AF. I ain't gonna say the words, <laughs> but he said, you're slow AF and he told me to go home. So imagine being 15 miles into your marathon, you're already somewhat delusional. So <laughs> I get into this argument with this guy and once I finished the race, so you, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do something to prove him wrong as well and create the Slow AF Run Club. Was this a fellow runner who said this to you? Brandis, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't know. This dude was on the side of the course with a beer in hand. So not likely a runner with a beer. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not running in the race with you, though. Exactly. Not running in the race with me. Okay. Um, since starting the Slow AF Run Club, and of course you've written your book with you brought, with a, you brought to show us today, um, your story has, of course, been widely shared. You mm -hmm. have uh, done, uh, you've been the cover story for Runner's World magazine, a nude photo shoot with Men's Health magazine. Um, what does it mean to you to have your story and your image, you know, shared on these platforms and associated with this sport? I think for me, it's, it's a definitely a big move because when I started running 10 years ago, there was nothing out there that looked like me. So now that I'm out here and be able to show people that they can be active in the body that they are right now, they don't have to worry about changing their body. It's really it's just so much uh, for me to just be that beacon of hope for people out there. What, what is it that you get out of, out of running besides, you know, giving to the members of your club and giving to others? What do you get out of it? So running changed my life. Running gave me life. Running gave me something where I didn't necessarily 
think I was going to even be here on this earth. Running has given me the opportunity to travel around the world. Running has given me the opportunity to chat with you. So running has given me everything. We're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's also, running has also been sort of a mostly white dominated sport, mm -hmm. right? Despite, you know, some very famous black people who we can all name who are runners, right, like right, Shakari right. Richardson and uh, Allison Felix, Usain Bolt, they're all, you know, Olympians, but also um, they're faster runners, shorter distances, mm -hmm. right, um, in track and field. Um, why do you think more black people aren't into running and especially long distance running? I think that's a great notion is that it really comes back to diversity. I know growing up as a little black boy in Detroit, nobody that I ever knew ran long distance. Everything was track, 100 meters, hurdles, things of that sort. I didn't even know what um, long distance running was until I even got into this thing. So I think it's one is awareness thing, um, but I also think that it goes deeper than that, right? It goes deeper to how in the neighborhoods we just don't we just don't have that um, that encouragement to do that. Yeah. Okay. So a matter of of, of encouragement. Um, do you think you've had an impact on that on on getting more black people into the sport? I hope the same. So I'd have. Yeah. Yeah. Have, like in all of your travels, like have what have you noticed in the people that you see and that you get to meet? Oh yeah. I, I think that when you're thinking about me traveling, I've been on a 50 day book tour, so I've seen various groups. Um, and various run clubs who, who have popped up and they're majorly um, people of color. So I think about here in Chicago, shout out to Peace Runners. I also think about uh, the Tortugas, you know, um, and when you think about Detroit, you think about Rerun 313. So there are definitely various hubs of black men and women who are also starting to run. And I think these neighborhood uh, clubs, or crews, which you want to call them, it'll be, is great for the community to get more black folk out there. Some people get into running as a matter of weight loss or weight management, mm -hmm. um, and you've said it's never been about weight loss for you. Um, you know what else? When you're out running, you know what is what does it what does it do for you? What does it mean for you? What are you? Why a marathon? <laughs> <laughs> I always joke that like oh a marathon you run 26.2 miles to finish about three blocks from where you started. <laughs> you didn't get very far. <laughs> what do you get out of out of that long distance? Um. I get a lot of things. I, I think first things first is the satisfaction of proving people wrong. It's something about showing up to the finish line and somebody look at me and look at my size and it's like, oh, this is your first time? And it's like, nope, this is number eight, number nine, number 10. Um, the other thing is that the process, of, uh, the process of training for a marathon, right? You can't BS a marathon. You know, the guy who even started, who even ran the first marathon died, right? So there is a lot of hard work and dedication to go with that. And I think that mindset that goes along with the reputation, uh, the repetition and training of marathon training makes me a better person. Um, your book is, it's part memoir, part guide for runners. Mm -hmm. What's something that you wish that you knew when you first started out? So funny story. Um, one of the things that I wish I would have known when I first started out is this product called Body Glide. <laughs> this thing, you Write put that on, down, yes, people. put it down, <laughs> Body Glide. You put it on all your moving parts, all your bits and your bites that move and rub together, and it will prevent what I call the chafe monster. So you go out there and you're running and you're thinking, oh, I'm good, and then you're going to take a hot shower and you feel like you've been cut by a thousand Ouch. razor blades. <laughs> so I wish somebody would have told me about Body Glide a long time ago. Do you find yourself dispelling any myths? For example, like, you know, the, the name of the club, Slow AF, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of like, I mean, if, even for me, an inspiration is it's okay to be slow. Yeah, it yeah. is okay to be at the back of the pack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell people. Me, tell me. <laughs> so, so let me give you some game. Most races are permitted as a parade. Let that sink in. So there's no such thing as a race permit. There's only a parade per permit. So once you get the elite athletes out the way, the people who are actually competing for money, all of us are participating in the parade. So there's, last time I checked, I ain't never seen a Santa Claus float try to beat out a Mickey Mouse float in the parade. Like, everybody's doing their thing and enjoying the journey along the, uh, to the finish line. And that's how I see right, uh, running races. Sounds to me like an excuse to get dressed up. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Put on something fun when you go for that run. Right. Um, uh, last question, you know, before we let you go, what do you hope people take away from your book and from your experience? Uh, one of the things I hope that people take away from this book is that they can do it. They can run, they can do whatever they want to be, right? Like my story is about running, but this book and my story is really about proving the odds wrong and letting you know that you can do anything in your body. All you have to do is get up and start.
Okay. Martinez Evans, thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Eight minutes go by fast. Again, the book is called Slow AF Run Club, the ultimate guide for anyone who wants to run. And we're back with more right after this. While our expressways aren't always that express, they do contain some information you might not be aware of when you're on the road. Here's Nick Blumberg to explain how our interstate exits are numbered in tonight's WTTW News Explains. When you're cruising along one of Chicagoland's highways, what's on your mind? What song to play next? Where the nearest burger place is? When all this construction will be finished? Do you ever find yourself wondering how all the exits got their numbers? It's relatively simple, but not necessarily intuitive. For interstates in Illinois that run north-south, like I-55, the numbering system starts at the southernmost point the highway enters Illinois. For interstates running east-west, like I-80, the numbers start at the westernmost point. A lot of times, the very first turnoff is exit one, but the next one isn't necessarily going to be exit two. That's because the numbers correspond not to how many exits there are, but to how many miles away from the border they are. So by following the exit sign numbers, you can actually track how far you are from the state's boundary line. Sometimes things get a little tricky. Where two interstates merge, the numbering system for one supersedes the other. For example, if you're heading downtown along I-90 where it meets I-94, the exit numbers jump from 84 down to 44. Which brings us to one more wrinkle in the system. Around the city, I-90, that's the Skyway, Dan Ryan, Kennedy, and Jane Addams, and I-94, or the Kingery, Bishop Ford, Dan Ryan, Kennedy, Edens, and the Tri-State Tollway, mostly run north and south. But the signs all say east and west. What gives? Well, don't forget about the inter part of interstates. Our highways are part of a nationwide system, and 90 and 94 broadly run east-west across the country. They've just got to curve around pesky old Lake Michigan to carry on their merry way, so they move north-south through the Windy City. So the next time you find yourself stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, you may not know how long you'll be sitting there, but at least you'll know how far your bumper is from the border. And you can thank us for that when you're on your next road trip. And you can see more from our WTTW News Explain series on our website. That's all at WTTW.com slash explains. Keeping up with the news of the day can be tough, but for 26 years, Peter Sagal has been making it fun for audiences across the country as host of NPR's weekly radio show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. We recently sat down with him and began by asking how the show came to be in front of a live studio audience. It came to be in front of a live studio audience um, because it was such a stupid thing not to do it in front of a live studio audience that even we eventually figured that out. <laughs> the show was launched, as you said, 26 years ago, which is incredible. I looked pretty much the same as I do now. Um, in, uh, in WBEZ in their studios. And the notion was, you know, we'd do it in, remotely. This was sort of pre-Zoom, Zoom, if you will. And the idea was I would be, as the host in Chicago, our panelist, Paula Poundstone, in Los Angeles, Adam Felber in New York, Roy Blunt Jr., wherever he was. And Here's the thing, if you have people in front of you, like audience members just, um, and you say something funny, they might laugh. And if there are people there who might laugh, then the comedians and myself might actually try harder to be funny. It's an incentive system. So eventually we figured that out and started doing it live every week starting, I believe, in early 2005. And I gotta tell you, when we had to go back during the Zoom, it was terrible. It was like having to move back into your childhood home after a lifetime of thinking you were getting away. And it still was kind of, you know, I didn't, I didn't want the Power Rangers posters anymore. I'd grown beyond that. Well, we, I think we all moved on. Yes. Uh, or not moved on, but yes. like we all grew into different people. So listening to the show, obviously, like everyone is quick and funny and witty, and you really have to kind of be on your toes Timing. to keep up with your panelists. Sorry, never mind. A little <laughs> com comedy joke. Yes. Do you, I mean, obviously you prepare. 
uh, for the show all week, just as everybody does. But how often, you know, you know, live radio, you've got funny people over here and you've got panelists calling in. Do you just kind of abandon script? Oh, all the time. Absolutely all the time. I recommend it in case you've got, you know, you're tired nope, of that nonsense. Nope, sticking just to the chuck it. <laughs> no, so my, my, my colleagues and I with whom I work, we prepare a script, we research stories, we find the sillier stories in the news, we think about them, we write jokes about them. Uh, we try them out. We have a very writer's room vibe. And so when I go in front of the audience, and, and we're never Big live, show. thank you, Big gods of broadcasting. Um, like, you, you, Unlike right here, I know, right now. I mean, I was about to say, I am terrible on live TV. I don't know what we're doing here. God knows what is going to come out of this mouth. But the point of the story is, is that when we tape our show, I've got that script. But you're right. We've got these panelists. They're nuts. That's why we hired them. <laughs> they're nuts. And so they're, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, dry, it's like preparing on a road trip and you've mapped out the destination and then you decide to share the wheel with four people who have no idea where you're supposed to be going. And they're and, not looking at the map. No, they're not. And so if they all of a sudden go left, say, and into a ditch, which is more likely than going right, this is NPR, then <laughs> uh, chances are I, my job is just to go with them because I can't jump out of the car. And that actually... Um, that was really an extended metaphor, wasn't it? And, <laughs> but and it was okay. But it's a lesson learned. I think it worked. Yeah, work? yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. I mean, and if it doesn't, we can just edit it out in post. Right, exactly. Obviously. And then the people who will never see it in tape will never know about it. But the <laughs> point of the story is, yes, and I think part of our show's appeal in an era where a lot of people are doing what we're doing really, really well, like John Oliver and Stephen Colbert and the Late Night Hosts, all these people who are like doing amazingly, wonderfully produced, sharp comedy and satire, we're just kind of making it up as we go along, ultimately. And, and that has some appeal, uh, as long as you can edit out the dumb stuff, which is why we don't do it live. <laughs> uh, the show is a news quiz. It is. Right? Um, fewer and fewer people are consuming news. We ought to know that, um, but we're, we're working on that. I How know. do you keep the news fun and interesting in this day and age of, well, dare I say it, fake news? I know. Well, we, ki we kind of have a news strategy. Um, we kind of ignore, for the most part, all the major news, the depressing stuff, the serious stuff, and just do the fart news, pretty much. <laughs> we cover farts in all, um, you know, a, 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 a eliminations, process of excretory things uh, very well. No, Spit, well, I, I mean, yes, vomit, oh yeah, well, uh, we, uh, we've done a fair number of that. Yes, basically any bodily fluid, that's our beat. <laughs> it's getting a little gross. No, the point of it, what people like about us is, and I to be serious for a minute, is, is we're the news that won't depress you. We're the news that will amuse you. We're the news that might, you know, I don't know, make you wonder about the vast breadth of the human experience. And when we do talk about the serious news, which we do, I mean, we'll be talking, for example, on this week's show about the new uh, apparent Democratic candidate, uh, uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, when we do talk about things like that, what our motto is, we say the things on the radio that most people are reduced to shouting at the radio. So if you're wonderful reporters, for example, you've just had on the show, probably think things but cannot say things because they are serious reporters. We are not. Uh, and <laughs> thankfully, you can say we what you can think. say them. And I think that's part of the appeal as well, that we're sort of a NPR's uh, unleashed id. Which oh, looks like me. Kind of like an anger translator. Yeah, no, in a weird way. And the fact, <laughs> and the fact, I'm thinking like of the movie uh, Inside Out, right? You yes. know, where they have, which I, by the way, I was in, a little cameo in the first one. Oh, yes. Uh, but if you think like, if, if, if NPR had a brain and I was like its anger, it, it would look like me, don't you think? Kind of. I get it. Kind of NPR's small angry. and bald. That's basically that's, that's yeah. total. Yeah, that yeah. tracks. That's yeah. yeah. I get it. So you you talked about this a little bit. Hosting the show since it was created 26 years ago, yes. and you weren't quite sure, or not weren't quite sure, but did you ever suspect it would last this long? Never, <laughs> not for a minute. I had a lot of ambitions uh, when I was a young person, as young people tend to do. I was a playwright and screenwriter, so I was imagining I would be the first person to win not just the Oscar, Emmy, Tony, and Grammy, but also a Nobel. I'd be the Me too. I'd be the knee got, right? That was my <laughs> ambition when I was a kid, uh, or even older than a kid. And when this wonderful job at NPR, which I'd always loved, NPR was a listener uh, for many, many years, came up, I assumed, well, this will be a nice little stop, and then I'll continue to move on. And, get to work on one of those letters. And instead I'm here, uh, which sometimes is a little strange and surprising. But one of the things that's been very, I'll say gratifying over the last few years is because we've been doing it so long, those young people who I mentioned, they grew up with us. Um, I've been a part of their lives, which is flattering. Sometimes I've been a part of their um, family relationships. Uh, a lot of, uh, say, women in their 20s bring their dad who's in their 60s, and he says, well, we used to listen to this when we went to soccer practice. It was our bonding thing, and now I'm taking him here. And that's, 
fabulous. So I never thought I would ever be a public radio institution. Um, and yet, uh, that's what the door, that's what it says on my uh, dressing room door. Uh, public, uh, radio, uh, public, public, like, uh, public radio know, like institution. Enduring public radio institution. Talking to Peter Sagal. Thanks again to him for joining us. Up next, we stop by a landmark theater in Little Village. If you've ever visited Little Village, it's hard to miss the Apollo's 2000 Theater, which is now one of Chicago's newest landmarks. For years, the place has been a hub of a hub for celebrations of Latino culture, but the history of the building and its owners goes much deeper. We visited earlier this year ahead of the landmark designation. Here's Joanna Hernandez with the story. For nearly 35 years, Javier and Lydia Galindo have welcomed artists from all over the world to the Apollo's 2000 Theater in Little Village. This is also an amazing uh, world music band. Jorge Strunz from Costa Rica, Arda Shear Fara from Iran, and in their band they have like a Mexican, a Puerto Rican, uh, somebody from Africa, uh, Cameroon, uh, Brazilian, just an awesome guitar uh, duet. They've also hosted politicians from all levels of government. The biggest event was a uh, a gathering for Al Gore when he was vice president, when he was running for president. And gathered community members for wrestling, fashion shows, and quinceañeras. The building known as the Marshall Square Theater when it opened in 1917 is now being designated a Chicago landmark. A decision Javier's oldest daughter, like Evelyn Stell, says has been Marshall almost Square 20 theater. years in the making. Um, a lot has been done to the building uh, in order to adapt to our current times, but being able to bring back and restore the exterior of it would be a great way of honoring the past and history of the building, its architectural beauty. A history captured in the terracotta facade and marquee, the prominent domed ceiling, and even the old projection room where operators left behind carbon rods and film reels. That's a time capsule because we seldom go up there. This is just a personal thing, you know, with me it, and her, you know, to actually maintain that, that sense of, of respect for the people that worked on it, the, you know, that built it, the architect that designed it. You know, they're gone, but they're still present here, and we have to respect them for the amazing job that they did. But the craftsmanship and big-name performers aren't the only history contained in these walls. Do you remember when Naomi used to go up on stage and just sing and be a, a singer or artist and play pretend? I used to dance, do gymnastics, everything. I think we both would. Yeah. So you. <laughs> or we would rollerblade. <laughs> yeah, that too, the three of us. In the 1980s, Javier ran a successful nightclub in the city. But when the club's roof caved in, the couple who had only been married about six months saw their future crashing down too. Our lives were like, now what? We had been so successful, we were being so successful, and all of a sudden your dreams are just down the gutter, literally right down the gutter. But it's like at that point, it's like, what have I got to lose? Javier thought back to an offer he'd received to purchase the shuttered Marshall Square Theater. It was a deal he didn't take seriously at first, but at the urging of the building's previous owner... We came to see the place, and when I saw it, I, uh, it looked like a palace for me, because it was, at the time, like a, um, movie theaters were like a palace. Uh, so I was in love at the first moment, so then... Uh, it was like a dream to become uh, the owners of this place. The place would become a second home to the couple and their daughters, Evelyn, Naomi, and Isis, who grew up exploring the theater. You could really be an artist, go up on stage. I mean, I'm really talking about using your imagination and playing. Now I know what it feels like to, to have a child and get a sense of what my parents must have thought. So I envision this being a playground for him as well and being able to just enjoy it. As Javier and Lydia began to pass the business to the next generation, they say they hope landmark status will revitalize the neighborhood and bring recognition to a hidden gem in the heart of the Latino community. 
you don't really see many landmarks in our community, uh, particularly in areas that are highly disinvested and where there's a high population of minorities. So it's a privilege for us to be able to bring in the prestige of being a landmark to the, our community. And although many big names have walked through their doors, the Galindo say it's the community members who've made the greatest impact. And I truly do feel like this is uh, this is part of my community. And being able to not just be a part of it, but also serve it and help those in the community establish memories and, uh, again, continue as part of the history and the wealth of history and stories of this building and have that form part of the community it is a great sense of pride for us. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. And the space officially received landmark status in April. There's more information on our website. And that's our show for tonight. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our newsletter, The Daily Chicagoan. You can do that at WTTW.com newsletter. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website. New. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to give back to its community in Chicago and beyond.